Hello, everybody. Welcome to class number three. I was just looking at the chat over here on my screen and the faces. I see Susan again and Carol, even Erica, who I think is abroad. Hello and welcome, Erica. Your giveaway from the Stitch People Day giveaways is on its way. Uh, thanks to everybody for joining today. It's so, so fun to see familiar faces, especially from week one and week two. Here we are at week three. It's fun because I'm here every week, so it's really refreshing and very fun for me to see each of you being here every week as well. So as some of you may have guessed, I went live on our Instagram at Stitch People, at Stitch People uh, on Instagram yesterday, just as I was getting ready for today's class. I finished Stitching the Witch, and I went a little off book to make her hat a little stripy and fun. I had fun doing that, finished her French knot and Boolean knot hair hopefully you were all able to get caught up as well and i stitched according to the pattern recommendations the vampire's skin tone black and white suit i guess is what that is and his red cape so that today we can focus on adding small details working with dmc light effects light effects floss and uh, i think we will have time indeed to tackle satin stitched real hair techniques whereas last week we learned the boolean stitch and french knot for kind of messy ringlet looking curls in a portrait for those who haven't joined in the first two classes i'm lizzie bean and i started stitch people we do mix and match do-it-yourself portraits so that's why my pattern that i'm teaching cross stitch and basic embroidery techniques is a portrait and that's why we leave a lot of the decisions up to you because with stitch people it's all about making your family portraits and everybody's family and every person is totally unique so you've got to take the reins and take the creative license just a little bit to make some of your own choices and feel creatively empowered to adjust the patterns as needed and kind of do it your own way so there were no stripes on the witch's pattern but I sure added them and if there's anything else that jumps out to you that might be fun to do for example today I'm looking at this vampire I'm even looking let me switch my overhead view it'll be easier to show you I'm looking at the sample pattern that I already stitched up you know, for photos and whatnot. And I'm looking at this vampire and I'm like, he looks a little barren. So I was thinking even today we could do a little bow tie for him. So it's not on the pattern, but it is how I feel today. So if you want to add a little bow tie with me, we can do that together. But before we get into going off the pattern, let's do what's on the pattern and get going with small details. So I'm going to start with his little teeny tiny mouth. Now, most stitch people I give them a little grin a it's usually a flat stitch that is about two stitches in width and a little half well I guess technically a quarter stitch diagonal just to give them a little smile you can also do a double smile you can do I've seen people figure out like little open mouth smiles I just stick with the uh the little side smile just because it's pleasant enough with Dracula he's got big old fangs well I guess technically with nondescript unnamed vampire <laughs> he's got fangs sticking out of his mouth and he does not have our best intentions at heart so I don't think I'm going to give him a smile although I guess you could kind of curve up his mouth and still have a fang coming out there I'm not going to uh, with that in mind I have this little leftover piece of red floss from doing the cape and I'm just going to use this to stitch the line that will become his mouth now I am thinking about when you create a portrait, especially, and I think this applies to a lot of cross-stitch patterns in general. Now, other cross-stitch patterns may have specific instructions about the order of operations, but this is something in the style of stitch people and how we encourage you to do custom things. You want to think about the, I, I call it layering because I've got a background in graphic design and in Photoshop and in Illustrator, you work with layers. But even in life, if you think about layers, uh, like make, baking a cake. You've baked yourself a cake. Now it's time to decorate it. Well, usually you're going to put on the base frosting. And then if you're doing a fondant, it goes on after that. And then if you're doing decorations, it goes after that. And if it's a wedding cake, you put a little topper on very last. Like things go kind of in layers. It wouldn't make sense to put the topper on before you've even frosted the cake. Similarly, when you're thinking about a portrait, you can you can almost think about your own body. So would it make sense to stitch the lips underneath the skin tone 
Probably not. Our lips kind of sit on top of our face. So that's why I suggested stitching up his face, skin tone first, then we'll add the lips. And then if I'm going to go to my straight ahead view here, if I had fangs sticking out like this, they go over my lips, right? So I kind of have my top lip going across with my fangs mm, sticking out. So we're going to do his lips first and do his fangs sticking out over that. So you want to just kind of keep layering in mind, especially if you're new to that. Just look at your pattern. Don't let yourself get overwhelmed by that idea of like order of operations. It's not as official and scary as it sounds. Just it's like frosting a cake. So without further ado, I shall stitch his mouth on. Perhaps I should talk like this, as we do the vampire. Something like vaguely Eastern European. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just looping my floss through the back because I'm starting with straight stitches instead of cross stitches. Um, I'm straight stitching the mouth as per the pattern. And straight stitching just doesn't lend itself to being as easily secured on the fabric as cross stitching does. So I'm just going to double check that I'm starting in the right position. We've got the mouth from this point, one, two, three, four to that point. It is one row up from his collar. So I'm just going one row up from his collar and bringing my needle up. And I don't want this to look too stitchy. I don't want his mouth to have this appearance. I'd rather have his mouth have this appearance only horizontal. So I'm just going to do one long straight stitch all the way across like this. I am using three strands of red floss and I'll show you why in a second. I just went three stitches over. I should have gone four stitches over. Spencer just called in a, a little question. We're babysitting my nephew today and Spencer's on playing in the living room booty while he's looking at the chat little three-year-old buddy. He's, he's a nice fellow. Alrighty, so I just did my one stitch. That's all I need according to the pattern here. And I threaded my needle through some of the existing stitching on the back to cast off essentially and cut that short. And now I can thread up with my white. And this is why I'm using three threads of floss. His lips look pretty thick right now. <laughs> but again, if I switch to my forward view, if again, I'm gonna have you picture here, I'll use scissors and a pencil to be my fangs. They would be coming out from my upper lip and come over my bottom lip like this, you see? So with the three threads, what I can do is bring my needle up through the thread, leaving one thread across the top kind of as a top lip and have my fangs, ooh, I guess technically they would come down like this, but have my fangs kind of overlap over my bottom lip and have my top lip coming over. So that is why I chose to do three threads. So as I floss up, I do want, I, I have the benefit of this sample stitch here. I'm gonna zoom in real close so you can see what we're up against. Let that get focused. So because of the light color of the skin tone, and I chose a very pale color because he's a vampire and ostensibly never goes in the sun, um, the white teeth, might disappear a little bit against the very, very light skin tone. So I did outline them in black and I'll show you how to do that after this. You may or may not like that. It may be too bold for you, a little too cartoony, totally respect it. So after we do our white fangs, we'll talk about what it would take to make those fangs stick out a little bit, what your options are. Um, but that's something to keep in mind when you're working with light floss against light floss. So, oops, wrong direction. Alrighty, so I'm just going to thread my needle with three strands, three threads of the white floss. And for those of you who are like three, what do you mean? Just a friendly reminder that embroidery floss comes in skeins that loosely have, um, that have six strands or threads loosely weaved together. So this is what a skein looks like. This one's new. And when you pull it off, you'll see I have six threads to work from. So after you cut your length, and I had already cut some white that I used for his shirt there. So I've got three threads split from that group of six. And the reason you do that, it just depends on the size of fabric you choose to stitch with. I'm using size 14 Ada fabric. I personally like the look of three threads of floss. Some people like four, a little bit, uh, 
thicker. I wouldn't recommend six. That's a lot of threads to force into the holes of these Ada fabric weave, but okay. So now um, the teeth go from the far edge of the lips down into, and you'll notice on the pattern, the point of the tooth goes in between the grid. So in between two holes of the Ada fabric, we're just gonna poke our needle straight on through. That's why I like to use a needle with a point as opposed to a tapestry needle that has a dull end. So I brought my needle up, kind of splitting these red threads and I'm gonna bring my needle down going between the holes of the Ada fabric. And I'm gonna do it again. You can see, I'll zoom in a little bit. There we go. See how I'm between the threads here? I can separate them. So I'm between the red threads and I'll share the whole of that first little fang that I did. There we go. And just to sort of finalize this, I'm actually gonna poke between the holes of the Ada fabric up by the lip. I'm gonna do a straight down just to fill in that and give the direction there. Perfect. Okie dokie. So I'm just gonna go over and do the same thing on the other side. Go up through the holes of the Ada fabric. Oops, I think I didn't get quite over far enough. Just backtracking. There we go, right at the edge. Up through the hole of the Ada fabric, down in between the holes. Once again, up between his blood red lips and down using the point of my needle between the holes of the Ada fabric and one down the center. Now, if these fangs look a little unruly or not quite right, I would suggest defining them with a single thread of black fabric or black floss, or you could use a, oh, I guess I'm still pretty zoomed in here. You could also use a dark gray or even a slightly darker skin tone color just to help those teeth pop. I chose black because that's what we've all got on hand already for the pattern. And I didn't wanna have to require you or make you feel like you had to go out and buy a whole skein of something else just to do this one little trick. This trick does lend itself to some options, however. So I've threaded my needle with one thread or one strand of the six strand embroidery floss. This is the DMC 310 black color. One little thread Rooney, very thin. And I'm going to pre-secure that like I like to do. Just running it through, oops, see I pulled too fast. Running it through the holes on the back. Just so I don't have to worry about chasing the tail like I do when I cross stitch. Cross stitching since you're in and out so much really lends itself to casting on the traditional way, which I typically like to do while cross stitching. With embroidery, you don't always have that option. Okay, so I'm bringing my needle up at the very far edge of the mouth and just following the exact same path that I did for my first stitch, going right down that hole. Now, as I pull, I'm going to do so slowly and I'm going to use my fingernail to separate, I've, I'm gonna grab, you can see where my white threads are from the fang. I'm gonna grab the fang and pull it over with my fingernail. Grab it and pull it. And I'm going to pull this black thread pretty tight. So it kind of wedges in there. Then when I release the white threads, I can kind of get them into place so that that black thread really tucks itself into the fang. And, it, and it's not quite as bold as it might be otherwise. And I'm just gonna repeat that for each of these fangs. So this is just a way to differentiate colors. Sometimes I will outline light elements that are against light elements. This goes for if I'm using a bright white Ada fabric like this sample instead of the off-white natural color. If I'm doing a white wedding dress or maybe for a Halloween stitch you're doing like you know a haunted bride or even a, a mummy in like white gauze um, or a little white dog against white fabric sometimes gets lost so I might do an outline using one thread of floss like I've done here 
In those cases, I'll usually use a very light gray or taupe as opposed to black. But again, since we have black on our shopping list for this pattern in the first place, I decided to go with that. And we pull that tight and it kind of tucks it away. Wait for that to focus. There we go. So I'm just going to repeat that over here on the other side here. Okay, just check in the chat. Don't have any pressing questions. Okay. All righty. Now I'm just spinning him around so that I can pull the correct direction, pull those bang stitches in, pull that black stitch tight, and it kind of lays underneath there. Oops, there we go. I'm going to unzoom myself so it's not quite so seasick for you. Okay, bring that up, put it back in, and I'm going to pull this way. This is why when you get into embroidery, a lot of people swear by using a frame or stand uh, because then you can use both hands. A lot of embroidery stitches, as opposed to just cross stitching, a lot of embroidery stitches are more most easily accomplished with a stand. I was preparing for on October 15th, we're starting a Halloween house. I don't know. I guess you could call it a stitch along. It's more a class. Um, we've got a really great little Halloween cottage pattern and we're going to embroider it together. And I was reading through the hand-stitched house book that we carry all about embroidering custom houses. And Teresa, the author, recommends working uh, hands-free, you know, where you don't have to hold your hoop like this, where you can secure it in a frame, and then you can work with both hands as you embroider uh, instead of, you know, like I'm doing a lot, putting it down and working with both hands and picking it back up kind of a thing. So that's an option. I know you can probably buy those online at Michael's. I've seen them in the store. You can definitely check out embroidery frames. So that's our little uh, vampiric mouth. I like to use the point of my needle as a tool. I see that one of these little threads of his lips is laying a little lopsided. So I'm just gonna brush it out, just like a comb. Just make sure everything's laying really flat kind of fluff these fangs, make sure the white is overlapping the black outlines ever so slightly, just to soften those outlines, these big old fangs. I think on my, this one, I put the fangs in a little bit closer. These fangs are a little bit wider. That's funny. <laughs> Up to you. Okay, so now I'm gonna work with the light effects floss. This is a really great offering from DMC. They have a whole bunch of beautiful colors. I have some just right here in my kit that I'll show you. Just all these beautiful sparkly light effects. I've got, you know, a great Christmas array. Obviously these like sparkle reds and greens for Christmas is totally gorgeous. Silver I use a lot. Uh, they even have, I think this one's a really pretty one. It's kind of a warm gold. The thing about them is while shimmery and delightful, they're quite stiff and can be a little frustrating to work with. As you can see, just coming off my bobbin here, it's already fraying. They don't like to cooperate. So sometimes people shy away from using light effects floss, but I want to demystify light effects floss for you and give you some pointers to using it so that you're not afraid to embellish with it. I figure a unnamed Dracula-like vampire would have a pretty glamorous, you know, velvet robe with gold something i don't know i liked the idea of it in the sample i believe i used two threads and i'm going to zoom in because i want you to see something that's an option i'll show you i'm glad i have the sample stitch because you can see what it looks like for the uh, embellishments i guess the lining here that's these gold lines i just did long straight stitches up in one point down in the other and it creates just a straight line, which is great. But because I'm using two threads and because the light effects floss has a tendency to fray like this, it does not twist itself nicely. And it doesn't have like those cottony fibers to sort of nestle in together and catch one another and stay cozy and close. So what this lends itself to is two threads sitting side by side. And it really does look like that. Unless I make a deliberate effort to twist the light effects floss as I go, this side apparently laid down a little bit more twisty 
and you can see how it twists around itself so it doesn't lay side by side. So this is one option, a straight long straight stitch, side by side two threads. This is kind of another option, albeit accidental, is two threads a little bit twisted as they go, but ultimately one long straight stitch. What I'm gonna show you today is technically actually a stem stitch, uh, or no, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I misspoke. It's a split stitch. Uh, we're going to split. So I'm going to grab two of these, whoop, there we go. I'm gonna grab two of these strands, threads, what have you. It's pretty easy to separate. You can separate it just like any other floss. To dumb, but it's gonna be kind of tangly and rebellious if you're not careful. So I'm just gonna let these lay side by side. So here's one thread, whoop. Here's another thread. Gonna zoom out so that you can see a little more clearly. And I'm going to line up the ends, but hey, look at that. Even the individual threads are already starting to split. And herein lies the curse of <laughs> the light effects floss is it just likes to split. It is a runaway rebellious thing. So in order to thread your needle with light effects floss, it can be very tricky because, hey, look, all of these threads going different directions. What I like to do, this is my trick number one, is get my fingernail right up to the edge and it sort of flattens all the little threads together. Because each individual thread of the six strand light effects, I think is made up of a couple different threads itself. So if you can get it nice and flat, it's a little bit easier to thread. I've also gotten a lot of feedback that Lizzie, you should just use a needle threader. Good point, everyone. Maybe I should. But for those of you who are like me and don't, that's the way. Just get it real tight in your fingers, line all those threads up and just sort of like little marching soldiers, <laughs> feed them into the eye of your needle and we're good to go. I also like to, even if I'm cross stitching with this, if I have the option to pre-secure it on the back, like I like to do, I like to take that option just because it will keep it in place. And it's one less thing to worry about with your light effects, because you're already working with some new and unusual variables. You don't want those tails hanging out. You don't want separation of your threads. You just save yourself some headache take a second and pre-secure that floss so that it doesn't go anywhere. And I'm gonna actually get ahead of it and I'm gonna clip off this little tail that I have there just to keep things clean. And I don't want to give this light effects any wiggle room to mess with me. Not today, light effects. Alrighty, so. We've got, my printer did not do this justice. So I'm gonna look at our sample as well here. So I'm going to create some stitches here, here. We've got one here and down the middle. Do, do, do. Like so. Alrighty, I don't know that that's any easier to see, but I just wanted to clarify where I'll be going. So I'm gonna start down here at the inside bottom right. And I'm gonna go up, let's see. I'm gonna do, I'm gonna teach you, like I said, the split stitch. So I'm gonna go one squares worth of length up. And I'm ultimately gonna need two or actually three, no two. A diagonal starts at the top of the second one. And there we go. So we see those threads, they kind of lay side by side. What I'm gonna do for the second stitch is come up between the holes of the Ada fabric and I'm going to split apart. I'm coming right between the two light effects threads. So can you see how twisting up on the back? You guys are lucky you don't have to let go of your needle, okay. So I'm coming up from the back to the front and I'm splitting apart the two light effects threads, okay? So I think my camera's having a hard time focusing that close. I'm gonna come up through there and then I'm gonna go down to where I need to go. 
So this second stitch is ultimately kind of one and a half long, but it's going to prevent it from looking split apart because I intentionally stitched it. Essentially, what we're doing is since we have two threads like this, then we'll come up between them and do kind of two more threads like this, come up between them, two more threads like this. And it creates more of a solid look because you're sort of weaving your needle, not weaving, you're splitting. That's what it is. Okay, so I'm going to actually come up between the holes of the Ada fabric again. And I'm going to keep going with the uh, split stitch up along the inner side of that collar. So you're going to go up to that point, pull it down, and again, up between the holes of the Ada fabric. Start my diagonal. There we go. That was kind of a half stitch to start my diagonal turn up between the holes of the Ada fabric and complete my diagonal here. Beautiful. So it kind of gives you this chain effect. I'm going to just top it off with one little half stitch at the end. So this is just a fun little extra you could do. If this overwhelms you or you don't like the way it looks, totally fine, not offended. Do it your way, do it with uh, straight stitches, do it with a different stitch, I, I don't even care. As I always say, there is no such thing as cross stitch police. No one's gonna come to your house and arrest you for not following the pattern. I sure won't, I don't have the time. And I think it's great that you're doing what you like the way you like it. So similarly, I'm gonna come back down, do my first stitch. I can tell that these are wanting to be different lengths. So I've likely got some bunching happening on the backside. So I'm just gonna run my finger along. You can see the light effects floss gets a little bit worn out with use. See how it's starting to really split apart at the eye of my needle. You can see that neon yellow coming through. That's just part of the fiber of this thread to make it the color it is. So just be cognizant of that. And if it's starting to get a little bit too worn out as you're working with it, just from going in and out of the holes and kind of working its way around all the other floss, it, it, it is bound to happen. When that happens, you might just want to call it quits and uh, end that little section and rethread and start again with some fresh floss and keep an eye but that is something that can happen. So I'm gonna go down the side here. That was like a stitch and a half, kind of like we started at the beginning. I'm gonna come up between the holes of the Ada fabric. There we go, right along the edge. In between the threads, you can see I'm splitting them apart like a good split stitch does. And bring that down into the end of that diagonal. And now I'm going to, it's kind of, because we're, uh, split stitch is really easy when you're working in a straight line. Because we're working at a diagonal like this, I'm now at this point. So I essentially did a stitch like this, a stitch like this, and a stitch like this. I'm going to double back like a little quarter of a stitch and go down like this, just to give myself some of that split stitch pattern to work with. Uh, actually, no, I lied. This is just, oh no, it does go down. It's just not straight. It is a 45 degree angle and a 45 degree angle and then a two to one ratio stitch. That's, that's what's in my head. I was like, no, I knew it changed. Pressure's on when the camera rolls, folks. Okay, and then we go up and split. And we go down into the hole of the Ada fabric. And we'll go back and split, there we go. And this is where I kind of meet up with the other split stitch that I did. And that tucked in quite nicely. So I'm just once again gonna use the tip of my needle as a comb, kind of fluff these guys, make sure everybody, if they're a little bit more resistant than the regular cotton, 
loss. So they're not going to be quite as malleable. I just want to make sure it uh, works as well. So now that we're in the groove, does anybody have any questions about that? If you do, feel free to leave it in the chat. If not, I have enough on my needle that I'm just going to quick bust out this other side. I won't explain quite as much as I go just because I did on the other side, but you can kind of see it in action again. And just careful not to let these light effects threads catch one another or not up too much. They, they get kinked being stored in a bobbin. I mean, I would too, to be fair, if I was threaded like that. But thankfully, we are not inanimate objects. Uh, but yeah, they, they can kind of, these light effects, you can see it's, it's kinked because of how it's been on my bobbin. So just keep an eye on it. Don't let the threads get too different in length, too much of a difference in slack, too worn out at the eye of your needle. It can really be uh, a tricky thing. I felt like I might have had a catch on the back. I did not. It's just stiff loss to work with, but it looks really cool. I think I, I really like the way light effects can work. Um, it's beautiful as French knots, just the way it ties around itself and then gets sparkly. I really like it. So hopefully this helps you. Again, if it, if it feels like your floss is getting a little too worn out, with the wear and tear of all this back and forth stitching, um, call it quits and rethread and start with fresh floss. Okay, that one went a little haywire. Some of the red floss showed through. So I'm just gonna double back, split stitch back into where we need to go. Kind of integrate my first attempt. There we go. Okay, and then I'll do my final split stitch. Like so. And got some red showing through. I'm just gonna pull the red over with the tip of my needle. There we go. Finish that off. All righty. So now we have kind of this glam vampire outfit, which I love. Very royal looking. Very fun. And we'll Cast off, just thread the needle through the back side of that. Double check my chat. Ah, nobody's chatty today. That's all right. It's, you know, third, third class of four. Very natural time to have a little dip. A-okay. And let's see. Let's do the hair. So I'm going to do sort of a traditional slicked back look. For Dracula. Now we have a uh, cross stitch. Oh, we could also do his eyebrows, which will just be one thread of black. God, I should have done that when I did the one thread of black for the teeth. Oh, well, we'll go back and do the eyebrows. Uh, for the hair, what I like to do with the hair, what I did before class was on the back side, I lightly outlined where the hair is going to go. One of the biggest mistakes people make with the kind of doing a real hair is you you have your little face like this and you're planning on doing real hair. So you're like, oh, I won't make the cross stitch pattern. And then people will just kind of like start going and they'll make hair, you know, however your hairstyle is. And you get this real flat head look. I'm going to switch to my camera. Those of you who've taken classes with me before, you've heard the spiel. I'm so sorry. Not sorry, because it's very important. If you look at my hair, it is conveniently pulled back in the top and front, kind of the way Dracula's would be is slicked straight back. But my hair is not flat by any means. I still have this nice round shape of my hair and it kind of, it goes, while we know it goes back, that doesn't mean it is flat. So my hair, my head literally is curved from left to right and back to front. Picture a human skull, you know, that's the shape we've got. And then the hair sits above, like I have all, I can press down 
on my hair. I'm just looking at my screen here. I've got all this volume, you know, that sits above my hair. So even hair that's quote unquote flat against my head isn't really, and I have thin hair too. Like I don't have a ton of thick hair making a big old crown here. Uh, it, there's just some natural lift and volume that goes back. Now, Dracula's may be a little bit more like this, sure, but even still, we've got this nice round crown of the head. So what I like to recommend is definitely design your characters with the hairstyles on, even if that means the cross-stitch hairstyles and then sort of converting it as you go to the real hair. Ha, <laughs> meant to do the back of this. Uh, like I mentioned, on the back of my fabric, I lightly outlined where his hair is going to go just to make sure that I hit that height of the volume going up and back with his hair. I hope that makes sense. You don't want a square head. That wouldn't look right. And with Dracula, we've got this nice widow's peak at the front. And essentially what we're going to do, I'll erase my more trendy hair here example. Essentially what we're gonna do, I'm going to straight stitch outline around the tippy top of his head just to make sure that I ensure that I have that height. I outlined with my pencil, but what I mean is I'm actually going to stitch the outline. Then I'm going to straight stitch from the center of his widow's peak because that's kind of how Dracula's hair would be. You've got this widow's peak, your hairstyle is essentially like this, right? So I'm going to do my stitches kind of like this if that makes sense. And the reason I know to do that is just because I'm thinking through what it would take to do my hair like that. Thinking through hair that I've seen that's styled like that. You could even Google a photo of Dracula and just follow, follow what you see. It is as simple as that. Not what you think it is. That's the key. Our brains like to preempt information to save time. Like, oh, I've seen a slick back hairstyle. It's just straight back. No, no, no. If you've got this widow's peak, it kind of branches out from the middle. So tell your brain to slow down and go with what you see. So since I'm doing straight stitches here at the top to outline this real hair, just checking my time. Oh, we got plenty of time, 20 whole minutes. I'm going to pre-secure my flowers because it helps. Donezo. And like I mentioned, I'm literally gonna stitch and outline his hair. I forgot to give him little ears. The pattern shows these little half stitches. Sorry, Dracula. I mean, unnamed vampire man. I don't know, I think Dracula is probably in the public domain because it's such an old book. Is that Mary Shelley? No, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, I think. Okay, so now I'm gonna do a little half diagonal to go over. Essentially, this is my, my little half diagonal. Then I'm going to do a 45 degree. And then his hair goes. Now this is going to look a little funny because it's going to be flat across. We can go outside these lines and we probably will just to get some natural, a natural look. Oops. My floss isn't matching up. So I'm just gonna run my fingers like this. Okay. There we go. But as long as we have this sort of outlined at the start, we know we won't go astray as we start filling it in because we're giving ourselves the lines to color inside of essentially. Like if you were to think of it like a coloring book. Okay, so now from the center of his widow's peak, I'm going to give myself my first stitch straight back. And what I'm gonna do is actually push my needle up at an angle through some of this existing stitching I'm going to go slightly above the hole in the Ada fabric just to push that thread up ever so to give his head a little bit more roundness instead of that flatness. And now I'm just going to go literally just like I did in this drawing here. 
So let's see. Erica says, fun to see everything come together. Yes, and Erica's great at details. So that is high praise. So now I'm going to come through the stitches of that outline like I like to do and go right into that widow's peak through the stitches of the outline to the widow's peak. And the reason I'm going through the stitches of the outline is because I don't mind it looking kind of flat or, or not flat, smooth is the word I'm looking for. Because this style that we're doing for Dracula, this like slick back style, at the end of the day, when you have a person with this style, it, I mean, it would look pretty smooth up here. It wouldn't look like this coming off their head right? Like that's not what Dracula looks like. This is what Dracula looks like. So we do want it to be smooth, but we just want to make sure that the direction of the hair into that smooth finish is, uh, is correct. So I don't want to catch the skin color floss. Just getting up right next to that. Fill this in. You can also make this like a lady vampire in a super cool high collared cape. Kind of dig that idea. Just give her like long flowing locks. I'm going to do one more strand that kind of goes into and above that floss just to give it a little more height and bring one down from the top and kind of tuck it in here. I don't find it looking a little more natural, you know, with some, some hair sticking out there, but you want to strike a good balance between all the way smooth and all the way kind of spiky, right? There would be some ridges technically along the top where the slick back hair is coming in. All right. So now, now the top of his hair is like this. What about his sideburns? Well, technically like the sides of his hair would still probably come down like this. So I'm gonna switch the direction of my stitches real quick to bring the sides of his hair down. And then I'll finish off with a few more over the top just to sort of integrate everything together. So I'm gonna bring a couple of these down into, into the side. And again, it's just thinking through how somebody with this hairstyle would do this hairstyle. What about his sideburns? Excuse me, hiccup. What about, what about the hair on the side? Especially if it's kind of this long hair that's long enough to be combed back and down. Well, where does it go once the length gets off the front of the face? It's gonna go down. There we go, and now I'm going to bring this kind of over and around and follow that. It's kind of like little sunbeams bursting out from his widow peak, widow's peak. Going in all the right directions and see how we have a little bit of, of like ridges like you would with natural hair along the, sm the, the smoothness of the outline we created. Because again, I'm like, if you look at my hair, like you can see that I've got like ridges happening in my hair, these little pieces, but ultimately the overall look is smooth. You see what I'm saying? As opposed to just like, it's not slicked smooth. We've got each individual hair is technically its own little hump. Okay, so. Just gonna fill in this one little piece of white. There we go. And once again, I like to take my tip of my needle and brush this hair, get him all nice and zhuzhed. 
How am I doing on time? 3.46? I think we could bust out the other side and add a bow tie to boot. So I'm just going to do exactly what we did, but on the other side. Oops, see, I'm starting to pull a little bit too much. This line is starting to dip. So I've pulled this stitch a little too much. So I just wanted to loosen it up and come up above. That's why I like to give myself the outline because it shows you kind of where things should be. And I can see this side is a little lower. So I'm just gonna integrate a little ridgy hair. So this top one isn't completely alone. Little ridgy hair. Don't wanna lose that outline. Let it be your guide. Alrighty, coming around the side. Work in the sunburst pattern. Okay, I'm gonna go over to the sideburns now. Bring some of this hair down into the side. Fill that out into the side. Okay. And we'll go over the top. Oops, I could center that up better. And of course, as I'm sure you can see and assume, I'm going both inside and outside the holes of the Ada fabric. Just kind of depends on where I need a stitch to be. And then I put a stitch there. <laughs> Because it's cross stitch and you can do whatever you want. Mm -mm -mm. That's the best part about crafting. I mean, there's something to be said for doing things like the traditional way, capital T, capital T, capital W. Um, things often look very consistent and beautiful when you follow the rules precisely. And I'm not saying you should like do away with quote unquote rules entirely, but I am saying it's a piece of fabric and it's some thread on a needle. So if you need there to be a stitch somewhere, just go put a stitch somewhere. So I've let this top area be a little bit high. You see there's that like one, one hair sticking out like alfalfa. So I'm just going to add a few more stitches here at the top to integrate that. Just a little bit more variance in some of these ridges as I keep calling them of hair. Perhaps he just got back from like hunting in the woods for bats or something. I don't know what vampires do. It's a little disheveled. There we go. See, giving him a little few more ridges, but overall the look is smooth. So go ahead and cast off there. And we do have time. I'll teach you a little baby knot. Of, of a lazy daisy stitch for a bow tie, because why not? So I'm gonna use the red again, just cause I have some on hand. I am going to use, I'll use, I can't decide if I wanna use two or three. And this is like in real time, I'm deciding to add a bow tie. I'm thinking about it out loud. I know what three threads looks like. It looks like the entirety of my Cross stitch project here. Three threads is probably a little too thick for putting a bow tie right here. We've just got kind of two squares to work with, but one thread I fear would be too few. So why don't we compromise and do two threads of floss? So I've already got this three thread portion cut from when I did the cape. I'm going to take one out of there and use the leftover two strands, two threads for a bow tie. Now, I know it's not on the syllabus, but it's a bonus stitch. A lazy daisy stitch is often used to make daisies, if you couldn't guess by the name. It usually creates a petal look or a leaf look. I will show you in a drawing what I mean. So I just pre-secured my floss. A lazy daisy, like I mentioned, is usually used around like a French knot to create a petal. 
So the stitch that we're about to create looks very much like these. In order to create that shape, you bring up your needle through a hole in the Ada fabric and you put it down right in the same hole. What that will do is create a loop if you don't pull too fast. Then what you need to do before you pull it out of there entirely is to come up, figure out kind of the length that you want your petal or leaf, or in our case, one half of a bow tie. Our bow tie is gonna kind of look like that. You wanna figure out how long you want that to be. In our case, it's, it's about one square's width. And you bring your needle up again at the outer edge of that petal and just create a tiny little tack stitch to hold it down in place. We'll do that on the other side from the same center point then you bring your needle up, we'll tack it in place, and then we'll create a French knot like we learned in last class to create the center knot of the bow tie. So easy enough, we've got this center point where the collar all comes together right here. You can bring my needle up. And like I mentioned, you put your needle right back down in the exact same spot. Don't pull too fast. This is the loop that's gonna create the first half of our bow tie. See how that made a, a nice loop? I'm gonna kind of like a French knot, just use my other hand. Mostly I'm doing this to show you what we're working with, but just also so it doesn't pull through too much, too fast. So I'm gonna let that go before it gets too far gone. I'm going to bring my needle back up one squares width away. And I'm pulling my needle right through that loop. Let me zoom in a bit so you can see. See how the needle is coming up right in the middle of that loop. And then as we pull and the loop becomes tighter, it will resist against my floss that I've just brought up. We want it to keep that nice bow tie petally shape. All right. And I'm just going to bring my needle back down, essentially where it came up, to create a tiny little tack stitch, just a little security stitch. And before I pull it too tight, I've left a little bit too much slack. This is very round looking. So I'm actually going to use the tip of my needle and kind of give everything some slack. I'm going to pull on the tack stitch because it's connected to that petal or bow tie. And I just wanted to pull that a little tighter so that the bow tie would pull it a little tighter so it would lay a little more flat. And if it's now looking too flat, that's okay. You do have some wiggle room here. So I'm just going to open this up with my needle. It'll work with you if you work with it. And then I'll tug it again, kind of get this bow tie shape to lay how it needs to. There we go. I'm gonna do it again on the other side. Remember today was all about those tiny, tiny details. And, and it, it makes a difference um, to add these tiny details. This is just two little loopy stitches, each just a square's width but it really can fill out the portrait. I might also do a straight stitch in the center of these lazy daisies just to fill them out with a little more color. So there's my loop. I went up point A essentially and down in point A. I'm coming up in a point B. I'm gonna catch that loop on my own floss. My lengths of floss are disagreeing with each other. So first of all, I'm going to straighten out what I've got. You can see how different the lengths have become, just the way it's been pulled. So before I pull everything too tight, I'm just going to double back with my needle, kind of do -si do these guys and make sure the lengths are the same so that as I pull it where it needs to be, we can see that indeed it's all laying flat like it should. Cute. Okay, I'm gonna thread my needle again. Cut those to equal. Thread up my needle, which of course is not happening quickly because time is of the essence. It's always when you need things to happen quickly that they take twice as long. Okay, and then we'll go back down in that B point just where we came up the second time to tack down that little bow tie, which is again, a, a bit too loose. It is amazing the small amount of space we're working with here. So it's easy for it to be a little bit too loosey goosey. 
this little loop is my tack stitch. I'm just going to pull it so that the bow tie portion gets a little tighter. Just tugging at it for it to lay evenly. Now when I have that, perfect. Hold a little too tight. And grab those threads with my needle, kind of restore where it needs to be. And we've got ourselves a little bow tie happening. How cute is that? Now I'm gonna bring my needle up through the center point one more time and do a French knot just to give it a little bow. So pull it up, hold the slack with my left hand, twist around my needle two times. I want this to be small. So I'm doing two twists, two threads, and a very tight tension. I'm putting it back very, very close to where I brought it up in the first place, but I'm definitely catching some threads of something else with my needle as I go down so it doesn't pull through. And I'm just playing with that tension between my left finger and my right hand with the needle in it till I can keep the loop no more and pull it tight. And now we've got if I just give it a little flufferoo, we've got this little bow tie around his neck, which is blood red and very cute, I think. So essentially, again, we did needle up in a point, created a loop with our floss by putting the needle down in that same point. And we brought our needle up and down either in the same point or very close. Same thing on this side. And then we did a French knot in the middle, but it's just, like micro because it's two little squares wide. So I'll cast off here and in my last two minutes, add his little eyebrows with one thread of black floss. Do, 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 do. We have one thread from when we did the fang outline. Things are just cuter when they're miniature for some reason. You ever see those videos on Instagram of like miniature, um, like people making miniature stuff out of clay or like make like cooking, like they're tiny miniature functional ovens or kitchens or something. I don't know how they do it, but they make these tiny, tiny little food like for hamsters. I'm not even kidding. It's just the tiniest. I don't know how they do it. There must be a market for tiny functional things. Okay, so the eyebrows I'm gonna do just like I did for the which. Let me zoom out, show you what I'm up to. So we're just gonna create these kind of angry eyes, like in Toy Story. I got your angry eyes. I'm gonna do the diagonal, let that lay there. Go out to the edge of his little face. Don't want his eyebrow in his hair. So just making sure I'm not catching any of those threads. Go back down. And same thing on the other side. So next week we will be doing the trick or treat lettering at the bottom. Straight stitching is not everything it would appear to be. So, I mean, if you feel like you need to skip that class, like I guess do it, but we'll miss you. and. We're also going to uh, talk about just some ways that you can add flourishes to the text, different options. For example, in the sample one that I did, I did these little like spirally orange and purple. Um, so I'll talk about how I did that and give you some other options for embellishments. And maybe we'll talk about some other bonusy things too. Um, but that is it for today with the finish of his little eyebrows. Thank you so, so much for joining us and creating this little vampire working with light effects, learning about small details, split stitches, and a lazy daisy. I'll go to my face so that I can say goodbye to you all, but thank you for joining. Join us next week. Go to stitchpeople.com slash Michaels for the updated link for class four. You do have to register for each one individually. And we will look forward to seeing you same time, same place next week. Uh, check out our Instagram. In the meantime, we've got a lot of fun things coming down the pike for Halloween. So visit us at Stitch People, all one word on Instagram. And we will see you next time. Thank you, friends.